Hi, I'm Laura. I'm with Hope Living, and today we are going to be talking about the future of travel. So the travel industry accounts for 10% of the global economy, but for the past many months, tourists have been afraid to travel. Reasonably so. So as countries and states open up, summer hits, and people that have been quarantined for months are itching to get out, travel seems to be more necessary than ever before. But what, what is that going to look like? What is the future of travel? So today we're going to try to find out, and Hope Living is joined by three of the top hotel CEOs in the industry, and I'm going to tell you a bit about each of them before we start. Um, first of all, thank you all three of you for being here. So, hi. <laughs> and uh, joining us from Bangkok, uh, Thailand, is Dilip Rajakaria, the group CEO of Minor International and CEO of Minor Hotels. He has been with the group since 2007 when he came on board as Chief Finance and Investment Officer before being promoted to COO in 2008. He became CEO in 2011 and this January he was appointed Group CEO of Minor International alongside his leadership role as CEO of Minor Hotels. Dilip has been instrumental in expanding the group's hotel portfolio, including the acquisition of NH Hotel Group, the addition of Tivoli Hotels and Resorts, and a portfolio of properties from Sun International in Africa, among others. Then from Los Angeles, we have Arash Azabarzin, President and CEO of SH Hotels and Resorts. Arash oversees all operations for One Hotels, a nature-inspired luxury lifestyle brand, the five-star luxury Baccarat Hotel brand, and Treehouse, Treehouse Hotels, which has its first location in London. He's a founding member of SBE Hotel Group, where he served as president for 12 years, and he has also worked in leadership roles with brands like W Hotels, St. Regis, and Four Seasons. And last but certainly not least, we have also joining us from Los Angeles this morning, Bill Walsh, the CEO of Viceroy Hotel Group. Since taking the helm at Viceroy in 2012, Bill has added seven new properties, including Chicago, Los Cabos, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C., and is preparing for the opening of new Viceroy branded hotels in Cartagena, Portugal, Panama, and Serbia. And prior to Viceroy, he worked with several leading international luxury hospitality brands, including Dubai's Jumeirah Group, Kempinski Hotels, and the Doyle Collection. So thank you all again for joining us today. How are you all? Doing great. Thank Fantastic. you. Very good. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for being here. So are we ready to talk about the future of travel? Let's do Absolutely. it. All right. <laughs> okay. So for the last many months, the world has been, you know, on lockdown, in quarantine. So how, in your opinions, has the hospitality and travel and tourism space changed most significantly? Um, Arash, let's start with you and then we'll go to Dilip and Bill. Sure. You know, the world as we know it today uh, will be the way we see it today with uncertainty and the ups and downs that we're facing. Uh, until there's a, there's a vaccine and then there's some type of a cure uh, for the COVID-19. Now, in the meantime, it's our job and our responsibility as hoteliers to take care of the guests who do still wish to travel uh, the best way possible. Uh, we had our first opening last week where we opened our hotel in Miami. And it was a great experience uh, to see how bad people wanted to leave their homes and, and come and travel. Um, and we saw overwhelming response from, uh, from guests and from travelers, but most importantly from our staff, uh, our team members who have been sitting home for the last two months and, and just waiting for, uh, for work. And uh, to see their smiles on their face was worth uh, every, every penny. And Dilip, how about you? Yes, hi. Hi, Laura. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. And um, I think uh, for us, um, you know, of course, COVID's uh, not, it's just not a humanitarian issue. It's also now turning to be an economic crisis as well, uh, as we all know and we understand. Uh, yes, the crisis has hit the travel and tourism industry very hard, and I think we will be one of the last to recover uh, because um, I think people uh, people are scared, people are not comfortable at the moment, uh, especially when you watch the media uh, and when you see the death rates in certain countries, it's quite, uh, it, it's, it's quite scary. Uh, I think uh, it's going to transform the, uh, the hotel and hospitality sector 
uh, this will definitely do, do it. Uh, but I think on the positive side, um, sort of being here in, in coming from Thailand and, and being based here in Asia, the only thing I can say is that, uh, you know, Asia has gone through many pandemics, uh, starting from bird flu to swine flu to SARS, which was the big one, and, and also most recently Ebola as well. And we pretty much bounced back pretty quick. And I think, uh, yes, there is going to be some uncomfortable feeling in terms of travel and tourism, but I'm sure um, we're quite hopeful that once the borders open and once the, uh, the, the planes start to fly, I think uh, tourism will come back. I think the bigger question is like, you know, people talk about travel bubbles. I think uh, that's going to be the biggest issue is that, you know, with, with certain countries having quarantine requirements, um, and, and, and certain other changes and some regulatory issues, I think that's going to be the bigger challenge, you know, where people will be a little bit more skeptic in terms of getting on the plane. Uh, but I think uh, we look at it, um, you know, that, the, that the, the travel and tourism will come back in terms of, you know, uh, people spending uh, what, what we call visiting friends and families uh, as a new, new priority. Uh, and also, I think initially, uh, regional and domestic travel will come back much faster than uh, international travel. So that's how we see it. And how about you, Bill? Um, thanks, Laura. First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a privilege uh, to be sharing the screen with Arash and Dilip, um, two guys I've known for a long time and have an enormous amount of respect for. So I'm just here trying to keep up with them. Um, I think in, 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 look, in terms of your question and the, the impact um, of this situation on, on hospitality, travel and tourism, I want to pick up on what um, Arash said <clears throat> about the smiles on the faces of the colleagues as, as guests were welcome back to a reopened hotel. Um, and I think that has been the most profound impact for me. I mean, the immediacy of impact of this situation was just extraordinary. Um, we've all lived through crises before, and whether it was an economic turn down, whether it was something which was perhaps as a result of a, an act of terrorism or a war, we've seen a decrease in travel, we've seen an erosion of business confidence. But we kind of bypassed the erosion um, component this time. And we went from an open industry to a shut industry globally. And I think that for me, the most tragic impact was on those colleagues who over a period of three weeks went from being in work to being out of work. And look, what we do in hospitality is not rocket science. I think there's a common bond uh, about being hosts first and always. At the end of the day, we get into hospitality <clears throat> because we're human beings who like to make other human beings happy. It's that simple. And I think to see our industry go through a situation where so many people were made to be so unhappy so quickly, where colleagues were displaced from employment, were, were as Arash said, somebody sitting at home, terrified, not knowing if they could pay their rent, if they could put food on the table, uh, looking after children and, and parents. Um, and I think that, that that certainly in Viceroy and what I'm seeing happening in the industry, which is inspiring me, is that those of us that were fortunate enough to remain in employment have taken on an obligation to work harder, to work faster, to work smarter, to work more efficiently to create the circumstances, those circumstances that we control, to allow us to react when the circumstances that we do not control improve, to get our hotels back to market, to stabilize those businesses as fast as we can with the primary intention of welcoming back as many colleagues to work as we possibly can. Travel, tourism, hospitality is a trillion dollar industry. Look, I'm, I grew up in a small town in, in, uh, in Ireland. I, I never expected to have a career that would involve the use of the word trillion. And it's a privilege to be part of this industry. Um, but it's also an obligation to be part of this industry. And I think we need to recognize the potential long-term impact of the destabilization of um, work and opportunity for people all around the world um, and I think we, we need to get back, we need to get open, we need to get busy, we need to employ people, and, and we need to create hope in the lives of so many uh, that are really quite desperate right now. 
you know, we've touched on this a little bit, but um, are we all, you know, wondering, are people going to be afraid to travel or are they going to want to travel because they've been cooped up for so long, but there is also that fear. So, um, Dilip, what are your thoughts there? I think um, when I, when we actually, we can actually base, uh, go back on actual data. Uh, and um, when we see some of our hotels, like we've got about 535 hotels today um, in about 54 countries. Um, China was the first to go into lockdown and China was the first to come out of lockdown as well. And today, when we actually see our data points in China, um, even though it's not back to pre-COVID levels, we're sort of getting there. Um, the restaurants have ramped up much faster than the hotels. Uh, so, and, and then we look at some of the other countries which are starting to open up and, and, and we see that the demand is there because obviously like, you know, I think there's going to be a big bubble where people have been um, staying indoors for three months and they're desperate to get out and discover the world again. Um, so I think this is going to, to create a sudden surge in terms of demand uh, for the next few months. And we're seeing that. Uh, we've started to open up some of our hotels in Europe um, and we're seeing sort of occupancies coming back uh, and coming back quite fast. You know, like we're getting about 50, 55%, uh, which, is not pre, which is not pre-COVID levels, but at least it's, it's pretty good. Um, and we're hoping Vietnam came back pretty quick. Uh, but the thing is, at the moment, all these the markets are coming back, but they're pretty much all domestic uh, because of the travel restrictions we have. So in our opinion, I think, uh, in my opinion, I, I would say, you know, it will take at least, um, we believe that it's going to take at least 12 to 18 months before we see some normalcy back in travel coming. Um, but in the meantime, I would say that the demand will be pretty much driven by uh, the domestic and the regional markets. And Bill and um, Arash, are you finding the same in the States? Go ahead, Bill, you go first. Um, yeah, look, I, I think it's interesting whenever we have conversations about how quickly travel demand will return, <clears throat> inevitably the conversation gets linked to people having the courage to travel and what steps we need to take as hoteliers to, to give people courage to, to allay their fears and what new behaviors can we expect. And, and, we'll, and you know, I know we're gonna talk about that a lot this morning, but that's only one of two reasons why travel demand uh, might be challenged to return. There is also the economic um, impact of what we're going through at the moment. And I talked earlier about the number of people in, um, in service industry and travel, tourism and hospitality who are out of work. We're not the only industry that's been affected. So I think first and foremost, we have to recognize that there will be people out there who will want to travel, who will want to travel quickly, and who will have the financial capability to do so. They will have some concerns and it's up to us to structure the service experiences in a way that gives people the confidence to travel. There's also going to be people who'd love to travel but can't. Either they are no longer employed <clears throat> or they have fear of imminent unemployment and are therefore being a lot more cautious um, with their spend. And I think with that group of people, what we're gonna see is that um, they will compromise and they will compromise on frequency of travel, but they certainly won't compromise on quality. Um, and, and, and something I've seen in a lot of downturns previously is that when people travel, if they were a luxury traveler, a luxury guest, they don't become a select service guest because of economic circumstances. They remain a luxury guest, but they maybe travel a little bit less and that puts an obligation on us to make sure that the experiences that they have are extraordinary because they're having them less frequently. So we got to help our guests to use their time to best benefit and to create memories that will last a lifetime. Nor do I think those uh, who have the ability to travel and, and who need the courage to travel, um, I don't think that they're going to compromise either. And I think just to play devil's advocate to, to the subject for a moment and, and to, to talk about some of the feedback I've had from colleagues in industry who have reopened particularly luxury properties. I think what we need to do is we need to plan for pretty radically changed behaviors in our guests. We need to speak to those concerns that they may have. And then I think we need to step back and be surprised about, in some respects, how little will actually have changed. You know, I'm hearing about luxury resorts that have opened 
um, that have eliminated valet parking because I mean nobody's going to want a valet parker in their car contaminating the vehicle and then the hotel reopens and the guest shows up and says I don't park my own Bentley or my Rolls Royce or my Porsche. Um, Resorts that have reopened with, with what we call a knock and drop approach to room service. You don't have to interact with a human being. You order, <clears throat> the food gets left on a tray, they knock on the door and, uh, and the following day, those resorts are reintroducing full service in the room, room service, because the guest is saying, hey, I've been waiting for this for a long time. I'm back in a luxury surrounding uh, and I don't want to compromise. But I think the key for us as hoteliers will be able to react to the individuality of the need of the guest because you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm noticing, and particularly here in the United States, the difference across the country to the attitude during this stay-at-home period has been unbelievable. There are, I'm, I'm in the state of California. <clears throat> in Los Angeles, there's one approach. And elsewhere in the state, I'm seeing different approaches. I was in Joshua Tree the weekend before last, and people were eating in restaurants. Fewer people seemed to be wearing masks. They were out and about. So those people, when they travel, will be coming from an environment that they've been living through this in, where I think they'll feel a lot more confident and they'll feel less cautious and they'll be okay with human interaction. And then you'll have people who come from more restrictive cities or states who have been living through 14, 15 weeks of, if you meet another human being, you're going to get infected. And, and that's a different mindset. And I think that guest is going to want to be able to see a lot more evidence of protocols that we have put in place to protect them. Um, but what you do for guest A might actually offend guest B, even though you're doing the same thing to two guests with the same purpose and intention. So we're going to have to be very nimble and we're going to have to react in the moment. And our, our teams are going to have to learn how to read cues, human cues, um, e even better than, than they currently do. I, I think it's a little bit different in the U.S. Uh, than it will be in Asia and the rest of the world. You know, the co consumer in the U.S. typically had a short-term memory on uh, economic crisis. Uh, we tend to want to forget quickly and get back to business a little bit faster. Philip, I don't disagree with your comment that 12 to 18 months to, for us to get back to what levels we were doing in 2019, that's basically what we are estimating today, that it will take us that much time to get back to the levels. You know, we were having our best year in 2019 here in the U.S. and in all our markets. Uh, but once there is a cure, once there is a vaccine, even a sign of a successful clinical trial for a vaccine, I believe will add a boost to travel. And what we're seeing today, we have one hotel open uh, right now in Miami. It's more local drive markets, as you mentioned, both of you mentioned. Uh, right now, even in the U.S., folks from New York can't, uh, tri-state area, can't travel to Miami uh, unless they're quarantined for 14 days. And this is serious, but some of our guests were met at the airport with uh, officers wearing fatigue and they had to sign a document and certify that they would do that. So for me, it is going to, it is not business as usual. It's the new norm. You hear all of this until we have a cure and until we do that. I happen to, most of our hotels are luxury minded hotels. And for a luxury traveler, like Bill mentioned, uh, they want a certain level of service, a certain level of commitment from us that, they're, that we're not going to cut from our services mm -hmm. and we're not going to use this opportunity to say, well, because of COVID, we can't do this. Because of COVID, we can't do that. So that is going to be key for your, I think your readers, your, your viewers, and people that do patronize in our hotels that we're not going to cut any corners. If anything, we're going to add uh, services and, and add protocols to make the guests feel more comfortable. <laughs> Bill, we do valet parking uh, at our hotel in Miami. I mean, when you're paying that kind of a rate. And by the way, if somebody doesn't want a valet parker in their car, we're happy to accommodate them as well. But yeah. I would say 99% of folks want someone to park their car. Uh, and we do offer room service at our hotel in Miami. But if you wish to have the room service and to go containers and deliver it and left behind your door, we can do that for you as well. So we're not deciding for the guests what we want for them. Uh, there are certain things that we are, though, and, and it's been very eye-opening 
you know, we are requiring masks in public areas. You know, one is a sense of comfort, two, of course, is a sense that we want to stop the growth of this disease, but you, you'd be surprised how many people arrive without a mask. I mean, you feel they're coming from another world, that they haven't been part of this pandemic for the last three or four months. So we have masks available, we ask them to wear masks. I think the psyche of some folks and some consumers are not as serious as others. Some, some people will not get out of their house no matter what. Others are dying to get out. I have people, when Arizona opened two, three weeks ago, I had people drive from LA to Scottsdale just to have dinner in a restaurant. I mean, it's, it's that crazy that people do want to, uh, to go and enjoy an environment. What we're trying to do is make that environment as safe and secure as possible for our team members and for the guests. So that, that's a quick story on that. So Arish, you mentioned having um, masks available for all of your guests. Um, Dilip and Bill, what are you guys gonna be doing for your hotels, um, you know, cleanliness wise to set guest minds at ease? Um, I mean, Dilip, I'll start if I may. <clears throat> Look, I think there's the, the, there's the basics and, and Arash has talked about some of those, um, having masks available, um, having, I think, more visible cleaning practices. It's kind of, somebody said to me, one of our, our colleagues that was working in our health and hygiene committee said, you know, it's kind of um, ironic that the, the cleaning industry has spent decades trying to figure out how to create cleaning products, removing the scent from them. So it doesn't feel like you're walking into to a swimming pool when you walk into a hotel lobby. And now we're all gonna be looking for cleaning products that have an evident scent so that when the guest walks in, that, that immediate moment is, okay, they're taking care of this space and we're gonna have people out front cleaning. I think we have released to our, our, our hotels, to our general managers, 233 new policies. Uh, directly as a result of this COVID situation uh, when it comes to uh, protocols, procedures, interactions, and, and health and hygiene. And, and that's the right thing to do. But I think there are other things that we can do as well that will speak to demonstrating the respect that we have for, for our guests, not only from a, a, a possibility of, of protecting, but also doing what we're here to do, which is try to say, how does luxury evolve on a daily basis? Uh, and how do we keep up with the, the lifestyles that our guests have at home and, and, and which of those can be appropriate in these circumstances? So one of the things that we're investing in very heavily right now is, is voice activation um, across our businesses. And uh, pretty soon we will have, and, and by pretty soon I mean in a matter of weeks, <clears throat> we will have rolled out voice uh, activation and voice command capability in every hotel room across Viceroy. Uh, we're working with Google Home and our guests will have an ability to speak commands, as many of them do using Amazon devices or Google devices these days. Um, so A, ticks the box, we're keeping up with people's habits and behaviors at home. But we're also saying to people, you know what, if you are concerned about picking up a remote control in your bedroom, irrespective of the fact that it has been very aggressively cleaned for you, um, then just speak to the television and tell Google to turn on the TV and what TV station, open and close the drapes, order room service, order an extra pillow, whatever it might be, um, it will all be available through, through voice command. So that's just one example of a number of, of um, service evolutions that we're putting in place that even if there was no COVID-19, even when COVID-19 becomes a memory, I think our guests will react positively uh, to these these service enhancements, and there's a lot, a lot more we can do. Um, because again, to pick up the points that the guys have made, guests will travel, people are sitting at home. They want to go, perhaps, depending on where you're sitting, they wanna go somewhere warmer, further, for longer. And our job when they get there is to make sure that we can demonstrate, as our hospitality ideology should, should commit us to, that we have been thoughtful in the detail, that we have programmed an experience appropriate for the circumstances in which we live, but without compromise. In my career in hospitality, I, here's one thing I've never ever encountered. I've never met a guest who checked into a hotel in order to be bored. They want to be inspired, they want to be stimulated, nor in these days have I ever met a guest who wanted to go to a hotel and feel like they're checking into a hospital. So yeah, let's keep them clean. Let's make sure we have all the procedures in place, but let's not do that at the expense of doing what we do for a living, which is to create memories that will last for a lifetime. 
And do that? Yes. Um, so I think what we have done is um, we've got many initiatives uh, by brand actually. Uh, so within the Anantara brand, which is a super high-end luxury brand, we've got something called, which is uh, the stay with peace of mind. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's something we have been communicating quite strongly to all our guests. Uh, we have the Avani brand has something called the Avani Shield and the NH and the Tivoli brands, uh, especially in Europe and LATAM, have uh, something called NH Feel, Feel Safe at NH. And these are some of the things uh, we partnered with uh, uh, some of the industry players like Diversity, Ecolab, SGS uh, to get uh, certification and, and also the health and hygiene standards as well. Uh, we've also partnered with some of the local health uh, um, uh, regulators as well. And also like uh, um, making sure that, that the WHO guidelines have been met as well. So I think here, and, and we look at uh, uh, electrostatic uh, spray technology. We've looked at uh, enhanced hygiene measures using EPA approved uh, disinfectants. So at least when you check into your room, you don't actually smell of disinfectants. You actually have a nice flavor, whether it's vanilla or whether it's lemongrass or something like that. So at least the guests feel that they're back at a hotel and so that they can enjoy the experience which they have actually checked in for. So there's quite a few initiatives we've done. And, and the other thing we're doing is uh, like what we call, we're moving more into technology. So we call it high tech, uh, low touch. Uh, so most of the guests high touch points, you know, we try and sort of make sure that it's pretty much driven by technology. I think some of the hotel companies, you know, like have um, made sort of uh, the health and sanitization as their marketing message, which I think we try and avoid it because I think the guests today sort of expect it, um, whether you like it or not. So they are expecting enhanced health and hygiene standards at the hotels and they want to feel comfortable, they want to feel safe, and they want to make sure that some of the larger brands have really uh, taken measures to, to, to make sure that the room is clean, the F&B facilities are clean, the, the starting from the limo transfers, you know, whether when we check, when we pick up our guests to, to the checkout and the drop off the guests at the, at the airport. Uh, so we pretty much touched every single guest point uh, to make sure that the, the, the committee on, the, on the, high, uh, the health and safety uh, committee have actually uh, ensured that they will, they, they've taken all the steps to, um, to, uh, to make the guests feel comfortable. Now you're all focusing on cleanliness, but health and wellness has been a global trend for many, many years. So in light of what's happening with COVID-19, um, is health and wellness going to become even more important? And if so, what sort of things are you all going to be doing to implement it? Um, Arish, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I, I, I think I can't wait to think about something besides uh, health and safety immediately. And, and that's something I'm super excited about. Uh, to think behind the pandemic, we'll, 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 this one shall pass too. We have been working very, very hard uh, on making sure that health and wellness is part of our brand DNA. Uh, we have the advantage of only having five, one hotels open today or um, soon to be reopened. So we can touch every one of our hotels a little bit easier than some of the bigger hotel companies. And, and health and wellness has been uh, paramount for us because that's just the DNA of our brand to make sure that we provide an environment that the guests can rest and, and re-energize and rejuvenate before they come back. Even at our hotels that are in urban location, we want to make sure we have that. From adding a, uh, a meditation channel to our TVs where gurus from around the world can do scheduled meditation with you to having uh, meditation gurus that can come to your room and do a meditation session with you, to going on our app and being able to contact uh, someone from uh, Thailand to be able to run a session for you, to having food and beverage that's all organic and, and, and nature inspired and, and local and everything we do, every step that we take in our, in our, uh, in our course of business is to make sure that the guest wellness and health is first and foremost. 
today that conversation is taking a bigger turn. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I did, and this has been great, and, and Bill and Dilip, I hope you agree, that for the first time, we're not competitors. Uh, we're all uh, on the same army fighting this battle together. And when I saw uh, the Wynn organization publish their plan for reopening, and it was 37 pages and very detailed, that gave me the sense of camaraderie that it's not about you know, holding notes to yourself and not sharing best practices. It's how do we make our, our, our hotels safer and better uh, and, and better sanctuary for our guests. And just a couple of things that we did that is a little bit different uh, that I wanted to share with your, your audience is one, we invested heavily in infrared cameras. Uh, we think it's very uh, disruptive for guests to come into the hotel and get their temperature checks individually. A party of four are trying to come and check into a hotel and you know, by the time you check four temperatures and there's a line outside the door. So we, we did buy infrared cameras for every one of our hotels that can do up to 100 people per minute. And we know right away if somebody has a fever and then we have procedures on how to do that. And, and the other thing, that the only other thing that I will share, you know, like Bill, we have hundreds of new SOPs, is once we clean the room and have the room in perfect order and, and inspect it, we seal the room. So when the guest arrives, there's a little seal that's signed. Just when you open you know, your bottle of water, you wanna hear that click, you know, that you're the first person that has drank that water, uh, the room is sealed. So the guests will break the seal when we arrive in their room. And we haven't eliminated housekeeping service. We haven't eliminated turn down service, but we give that option to the guests. If they don't want turn down service, if they don't want daily service, we'll deliver pillows, uh, towels and sheets and essentials and take out the trash for them. But we, we try to make life as comfortable as possible uh, for the guests without having them feel uh, like they are in a hospital, like Bill said. Amazing. And Bill? Yeah, um, look, many of the same things, and I think Arash is absolutely right. We, we are working as an industry together, which is, which is fantastic um, to see. And it's like we have one, one big alliance happening. Dilip and I happen to both be part of the Global Hotel Alliance with our respective brands, but it's almost like we've created a hospitality-wide alliance. Um, and I've had multiple conversations with colleagues in other companies where I'm happy to share the initiatives. And particularly if there are smaller uh, companies or individual hotels, you know, I have resources perhaps that they don't have and, and you know, I'm not being protective about it. So I think if we can share with each other, then everybody benefits, especially the guest. Um, health and wellness has and will continue to be a very important part of our offering. Again, our guests don't compromise. They expect us to offer best in class. And one of the things that, that we have done is to partner um, with the right people. Uh, Harley Pasternak, who's based here in Los Angeles, a celebrity fitness trainer who, who has quite a uh, a global reach is, is helping us design our gyms. We have an extraordinary gym we've put in place in Viceroy Los Cabos that Harley designed. Um, and it, it's giving the guests that space to, to program for themselves, for continuity of programming that they have at home uh, while they're on the road. But I think what's going to become even more important, and, and Rash touched on it, is um, mental health. It's, it's de stressing, it's mindfulness, it's those areas. Um, because for all of us, um, the last 14, 15 weeks um, has been a journey into the unknown and that has been stressful. And, and there have been multiple occasions when I'm sure everybody wasn't sure what to do next. And that's taken its toll. So as people get back to their normal routine or whatever version of normal will exist when they come to our hotels, I think certain things that we've talked about earlier will still apply. Um, the guest who flew first class or private is still going to fly first class and private. They're going to want a luxury transfer to the hotel in the manner that's been described. They'll walk proudly into the lobby, delighted to be back, carrying their favorite piece of Gurkha luggage, and they'll walk up to the desk and they'll check in. But then they'll want to be able to evidence that we have made an effort um, on their behalf. I think more and more guests are going to want to connect with the purpose of the brand than ever before. And I think many brands have been able to demonstrate their purpose. So for us, it's about having an evident ideology, but that's not just inward facing, it's outward facing. And that we can say to our guests, this is not only what we do, this is not only how we do what we do, but this is why we do it. And, and here are some programs 
that speak to and activate the spirit of the brand that you have aligned yourself with. Uh, we're launching a program um, today, I guess, first time we're talking about it publicly, called Contribution Without Compromise. Uh, and we're putting a program in place across all of our hotels whereby if a guest wants to say thank you to one of those healthcare heroes that has helped us throughout this, this pandemic, they have gone to work. They have not stayed at home so that we could safely. Um, they can do so just by doing what they want to do, just by showing up and by checking in um, a guest occupying a room that will trigger the release of another room available at a 50% discount for a member, a frontline member of, of, of the healthcare profession. Um, so it's contribution. I'm making the world a better place. I'm giving back. I'm saying thank you to these healthcare heroes without compromise. I'm doing it by doing what I would have done otherwise. So we're not asking people to make a donation. We're not putting a surcharge on their stay. We're just saying, show up, be yourself, have fun. And by doing so, you'll, you'll allow us on your behalf to give back. Uh, and we think it'll be very positively received because we've seen guests connect with brands. We've seen people connect with brands that have shown their humanity and their compassion uh, throughout this pandemic. And I think that one of the ways people will, will feel better about themselves is also uh, continuing this, this sense of giving. One thing I've noticed throughout pandemic is people who could no longer do what they do for a living started to do what they do for a giving. Chefs, normally you'd have to pay 200 bucks to join Masterclass to find out how Thomas Keller makes a Bernays sauce. Suddenly he's putting it on Instagram. So, so many chefs were sharing free recipes. Golfers who couldn't go out and play on the PGA Tour were loading their Twitter feed and Instagram with free tips to help amateurs share in their knowledge. And I think that's been a real positive and it's been very well received. And I think it's up to us to, to, to take that baton and to keep going and to program for our guests when they come to the hotels in ways that gets them mentally stimulated, gets them involved, is interactive, is educational. Because I think after, after the period people have been through, they want more than to just sit by a swimming pool. Um, and, and I think we can very creatively build on those and at the same time show our soul, show our purpose and show our humanity as hoteliers. Well said. And Dilip, how about you? What, is it, what are your brands doing? I think, um, you know, the Anantara, each of our brands have, um, you know, especially being in Asia, I think uh, we have the luxury of uh, health and wellness being one of our key pillars or what we call one of the experiential drivers like for each of the brands. Um, what we did last year, for example, is uh, if, I, if I take it by brand with Anantara, we partnered with a company called Verita, uh, a, a listed company out of Singapore, actually. And what we are doing is we're doing preventative wellness. We have done immune boosting. Uh, we've done health and wellness retreats. And also we've done medieval, we've gone into medi-wellness as well. And IV as well. Like, you know, we've got IV treatments. Like, say, for example, in the Maldives, uh, some of the Anantara hotels, we actually offer IV treatments for, for vitamin boosting, for immune boosting, and also what we call... Um, you know, if you have a hangover, we have something for that as well. Like, you know, where people who had hangovers can pretty much get uh, on an IV and then, um, and then enjoy uh, the facilities thereafter. Uh, we, we've also partnered with another company called VLCC uh, out of India uh, in terms of um, uh, alternative medicine, uh, which is uh, customized diets, uh, physical fitness, um, and, and there, uh, it's mainly with the Avani brand. We partnered with them to, to, to offer our guests uh, that lifestyle. Um, and because I think we feel that wellness is going to be uh, the next key. I think like, because if you look at spa, spa started as a pampering spa, uh, then it became more into wellness, but now we call it more into a 360 degree wellness program. Um, we also own the St. Regis in Bangkok, um, and there we've partnered with uh, Clinique La Perry, uh, and basically, so we're bringing uh, La Perry into Bangkok, uh, which will open uh, this in this quarter. Uh, and again, uh, we are we're doing treatments like colonic hydro uh, hydrotherapy, high tech body contouring, uh, body remodeling, cellular photo, you name it, uh, everything. Uh, to do with uh, La Perry. 
uh, which is one of the top end brands. Uh, so, so I think, and, and the lastly, I think we've also partnered with uh, here, um, there's a, one of the biggest private hospitals called Bamungrad. Uh, and basically it's a, it's a, it's a tripartite agreement between us, Bamungrad, uh, and, uh, and creating a wellness experience where people can actually, once they've, once they have had their treatments or once they have finished their operation, uh, when they have to recover, you know, they can come into uh, these resorts uh, where it's tailor-made uh, and Bamungrad will provide uh, the medical, uh, the facilities and the, uh, and the care. And we provide the luxury living uh, so that they can recoup and recover uh, after their operation. So because because most hospitals, they want the patients out um, as soon as the op is done, operation is done, so that they can then turn around the bed. So we, um, so in in that space, wellness is a big space for us, and we feel that, you know, the future of hospitality there is going to be another pillar, uh, which is again going to be driven by wellness. And and again, you know, you're looking at long stays. Uh, people who come for a three day, five day, or a fourteen day program. And then people who also come for a tune-up as well. So I think wellness um, will definitely, it's, it's on our radar and it's something we are focusing big time. Now the question remains, um, this is our new normal, but is this normal here to stay? What do you think? Um, Arish, how about you start? I, 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 I don't think that it will stay long term. I think there are many, many people around the world that are working for cure and there's still so much unknown around this uh, pandemic and this disease and how it reacts and how it goes and how it uh, transmits and there's still so much we need to learn about this so my in my opinion and what we think at the firm we're a big believer that the hospitality business will be stronger uh, after this because the lessons that we've learned through this pandemic and then what we have done will make us only that much stronger, uh, but once there is a there's a vaccine, like I mentioned earlier, and once we know more about this disease and the unknown has been approached, I think we get back to normal, and, and we get back to normal in a better way with better sanitary standards and better cleanliness standards and better uh, touch points that we had taken for granted before. Uh, so it will take us, uh, you know, I would assume. Uh, they're doing the first clinical trial of, of a vaccine this summer. I think they're, they're trying some other rogue vaccines in, in the East, and, and they're trying uh, to circumvent uh, the long time it takes in the U.S. to do that. But everyone in America is working on a cure. And then once there's a vaccine and there's some good news, I think we'll come back out of the new norm into normality. And it will take Again, 12 to 18 months. I was around when SARS hit, and, and you know, uh, a year after it was over, it was a distant memory, and we didn't even think or talk once about it for years to come. And Zika that hit Miami, and then you thought the world was going to come to an end, and Miami business dropped 40% after the Zika crisis. And sure enough, two years later, it was the best year Miami ever had. So especially in the U.S., uh, I think once international travel starts, once the limitation on uh, inter-country or local uh, quarantines go away, and domestic flights pick up, I think we'll get back to, uh, to normal. It could take uh, six months at a minimum, but it could uh, take up to 12 months uh, for us to get to near the norm. But no, this is, I, I am, hopeful and I'm confident that this is a, a short-term problem that we have. We know what the problem is. We just have to find a solution. And once we do, we will be out of it. And Bill? Yeah, um, I think Arash is completely correct. I think we will get back to whatever normal was or, or will be from a, uh, from in terms of business levels and demand, people will forget because people were programmed to. You talk to somebody about experiences that they had five years ago, one year ago, three months ago. Um, and people will typically recall the best parts of a day or an experience and, and have to be reminded because we're programmed to 
black black it out and to say you know we're gonna we're gonna remember the good stuff and people will we'll talk ourselves back into success i think in in terms of of a new normal i certainly hope that some of the attributes that have emerged uh, during this pandemic situation do become part of the new normal i talked about some of them just a moment ago that that desire for for learning for exploration for compassion for people um, changing the way that we communicate. And I hope that is a new normal. I mean, we at Viceroy, we've changed. Um, <clears throat> we're a very close-knit team, used to coming into an office and interacting with each other, having physical proximity to each other every day. And we haven't had that. Um, we're now only seeing each other on screen. We've never been closer as a team. We haven't had any hotels open. We've never been busier as a team. And the spirit, the, the, the collaboration, um, and the tone of voice that has emerged from us as a, as a brand, which is not forced um, through programs that I'm extremely proud of, such as Viceroy at Home, where we used our social channels to make sure that we had continuity of connection to our guests and, and, and to travel partners. The tone of voice that we're using, the content that we're posting has become uh, much more spontaneous, much more humorous, much more raw. Uh, less filtered. Um, and I hope that stays because I think that we have become more uh, real in communication with each other as a result um, of these circumstances. And I think that some of the programming that we talked about doing um, will, will become uh, uh, a normal. But I think ultimately, you know, we've said it on, on multiple occasions, people want to get back to travel. <clears throat> I think they they will be careful and they will consider the brands that they align with. I think, again, purpose is going to be an evidence of purpose is going to be important. And I think there are a lot of smaller brands who have made a real effort during the pandemic that I, that I hope are supported. I talked about Gurkha earlier, one of my favorite um, luggage brands um, who, who, who have fought and, and also been very creative in their communication and continue to develop great product. <clears throat> one of the things that I've gotten into during lockdown is, um, believe it or not, trying to stay healthy, is the, the electric bike world. I never knew it existed. And now I go for miles around Los Angeles every evening. And that's introduced me to other brands. There's a brand called Nirika that a young UA national in Dubai has created, which is this extraordinary bike. And I'm loving um, exploring and, and, and finding out about and, and aligning myself with people that I never knew about. And I think that's going to be a normal. People are going to continue to be more inquisitive and to continue this journey of exploration, whether it's mental or physical exploration through travel. And, and we should encourage them to do so and be there to welcome them with open arms. Can you do that? Um, yeah, I think um, just to add, you know, I would say, yes, there is going to be a new normal. Uh, I think uh, six months ago, um, you know, if you did, there are some new terminology which is coming up like work from home, uh, WFH, uh, you know, no one ever thought like, you know, this will happen. Uh, but, you know, circumstances has forced us that, uh, you know, we, we as, as human beings, we've sort of adapted ourselves to, to, to work from home. Technology is, is, is another key element today. Like, you know, and, and the companies uh, who have been behind this are going to be left out because, you know, again, if you, if you don't transform yourself and this is the time, you know, people, people talk about transformation um, and if you haven't transformed yourself in the last six months I think you're already uh, you missed the bus um, but again uh, I think in terms of new normal uh, I think there will be some new focus areas uh, even in terms of travel in addition to uh, to other things like uh, say for example travel to remote destinations uh, I think that's going to be another thing we, we see it we look at back to nature and, and great outdoors in terms of travel, uh, whether it's F&B experience or spa or anything like that. Health and well-being, as we said before, uh, it's going to be something what we might call a new normal. Um, and then, you know, you have the private jet travel uh, or, or sort of island experiences where, you know, we feel that people will buy the residential, um, even talk about hotel rooms, and we have residences as well. I think that's going to be a new normal where people will feel more comfortable uh, coming in as one family and, and sort of staying and enjoying the experiences. So I think, yes, um, 
but I, again, the tourism industry uh, is is so uh, resilient. Uh, and and in the past, we have seen, uh, especially, I don't know. I can only talk uh, about uh, if I if I talk about Thailand. You know, say Thailand has gone through every single year. We've had some catastrophe, uh, whether it's a uh, political violence or whether it's uh, a, a nature, uh, some disruption, whether it's floods uh, or, or whether it's a pandemic. We, we've had it all. Like, you know, we've had the bird flu, SARS, uh, swine flu, uh, everything. Mm -hmm. But the recovery has been pretty quick. Uh, I think people tend to, uh, as human beings, we have a short memory and we tend to forget. And I think things will get back to normal pretty quick. I think the big deciding factor is going to be uh, how the countries, the, the, because obviously the lockdown in most countries, uh, COVID, uh, because of the humanitarian issue, uh, has actually triggered an economic crisis. And, and that's going to drive unemployment. We see that happening. Uh, and, and that's going to be another deciding factor, like, you know, in terms of the new normal uh, and how travel is going to be whether people will travel within, uh, so within the country or within the region, or, and, and it's going to take some time for them to explore uh, or, or brave enough to travel international um, or long haul, I would say. So that's going to take some time. I think long haul will take some time, and that's why we think uh, you know, it's going to take about 12 to 18 months. Uh, but I would say domestic and regional travel is going to to rebound pretty quick. Great. And so we have time for one last question. And I guess it's going to be mostly in summary, um, in all of your opinions, uh, what is the future of travel? And uh, Dila, let's start with you first, just to continue on with your theme. The future of travel. <laughs> I think, um, as I said, um, confidence in tourism will return uh, because people love uh, human beings love to be with uh, human beings and they love the personal touch and they love to experience uh, outdoor facilities and, 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 and of course, you know, certain European countries, no matter what happens, you know, like the, the Europeans have to have their two week holiday. If they don't have it, there's something really wrong. So I think that's going to, mm -hmm. that's, uh, so we're quite confident that, uh, uh, that that will return I think there is pent up demand uh, for travel. Uh, there is desire to re-experience what we call freedom uh, and nature and to escape. Uh, so I think, and, and again, there is desire to invest in personal well-being. So we see uh, that, our, but our primary focus is in the coming months to make sure that the guests feel comfortable uh, with the health safety measures uh, which we have and to make sure like we, we can provide all the experiences um, what they want uh, and, and, and within uh, sort of the control environment as well uh, or within the regulatory uh, rules and regulations which each of the countries may or may not have. Uh, and also I think mostly, I think the important thing is I think the brand reputation uh, will play an important role uh, in the future, in terms of decision-making process, mm -hmm. in terms of guests moving forward. Uh, so I think that's going to be the big one. So some of the larger brands, uh, you know, through their band, brand reputation and, and their strong distribution and all those, they will survive and, and they will sort of come stronger. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we're already seeing some of the smaller brands or some of the brands which are owned by um, uh, single owners uh, are starting to sort of fall off and, and they are having an impact. And so therefore, in a way, uh, you know, the supply will shrink, uh, but at the same time, the demand has already shrunk. Um, we don't see that demand returning quickly within the six to 12 months, um, as I said before. Uh, but again, um, we are confident. So yeah, I think uh, we're quite positive. Thank you very much. And Arish? Uh, I, I think um, well, I always uh, start by saying we're in the business of making memories. And that's what we do. Um, the future of travel short term uh, will be possibly less trips by folks. Because one, they're worried to 
and then U.S. unemployment reached 14 percent. And I understand those in the luxury segment might not worry about their next trip, but those in the middle class and then folks that are worried about their job or lost their jobs might not travel as much and put that summer vacation on hold. So we have to make sure every memory and every experience that we touch is amazing because that could be, uh, could be a lot less of them coming and people are gonna save to be able to do that. Short term, we have to be more diligent, more careful, and make sure that our staff and our, our guests feel as comfortable as possible. Long term, I think the pent up demand uh, and, and the fact that groups and conventions have canceled their annual meetings and, and lots of uh, sales meetings and, and what have you have been postponed. We will see a, a big surge in hopefully 22 uh, by having these folks that haven't met uh, as a group in a year, year and a half to come back. So uh, short term, we have to be very diligent. It's going to be uh, a tough road for the next six to eight months and folks who come do expect more because they haven't been out for a while and and they might be spending more than they wish. Uh, but long term, I think our industry, I echo Bill and Dilip, our, our industry is very resilient and, and, and travel is such a big part of the world's culture and, and what people do. And, and, and that's my biggest source of entertainment is when I travel and I enjoy seeing uh, new cities and new sites. So I don't think uh, long term will have a big impact on our business. Thank you, Arish. And Bill, um, how about you close us off? Great, thank you. Um, building on what my two, two extremely talented colleagues have said, um, I agree with, with all the points they've made. I think ultimately the future of travel sees us fulfill our obligations in the same, to the same points that we did in the past of travel, but interpreting them in a different way. What are we here to do as hoteliers? We keep our guests safe, warm, and nourished. It's been around for centuries. That, that's, that's what we do, but we're going to interpret that in a different way. Keeping people safe has taken on a greater importance and pe giving people confidence and peace of mind um, that, they can, that they can travel. And, and keeping people nourished spoke to the kind of uh, basic nourishment of, of keeping people well-fed and healthy. I think spiritual nourishment uh, is going to be as important uh, going forward. I think to the points we talked about, people are going to look to travel <clears throat> to be an equalizer. It's going to be a recalibration from the upset, from the disruption of routine that has been created and, and, and we need to be there for that. I think the future of travel is gonna require us to work harder to create those memories, those distinct memories that Arash talked about. <clears throat> people may travel less, people will be more focused on value, but not just financial value. So the way we evidence purpose of, a, of an experience. We're opening a hotel in Washington, D.C., one of two hotels in D.C. this year called Hotel Zena, and it's going to very evidently and proudly sit on a purpose to celebrate the achievements of empowered women throughout the ages. And we're, we're going to stand up and say, you know, this is what we stand for, this is what this hotel stands for. And I think that people are going to want more and more to know what the soul of a brand is the heart of a brand, because we can all make beds and we can all check people in and we can all serve coffee and we all do that very well. So I think it's about being unabashed provocateurs. It's about being able to let our individuality and our personality shine, um, to be honest, to be transparent, to be human. Um, people have always traveled, people will always travel and people like us will always be there to welcome them. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us today. It's been very eye-opening and very informative for me and I'm sure for everybody watching at home. So thank you all from Hope Living. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank Have you a great rest of your day. Good night, Dylan. Good night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye. Thanks.